Coming up, Israeli archaeologists unearth a village, a road, and a rare coin that all date back to the time of Jesus. Welcome to 700 Club Canada, and today we're going to Israel. I Absolutely. love when we get to visit Israel, Bill. Yeah, I do. I too, too. And there's yeah. so many things that we can learn. I love how archaeology confirms the Bible, affirms what we believe, and it reminds us Jesus actually existed and really did yeah. these amazing exactly. things. Exactly. I'm, I'm really hoping I get back there soon, too. <laughs> now that traveling started yes. again, Let's I'm looking it. forward. There's so many things to discover. In 2020, did you know that the, the discovery of the remains of a palace that possibly belonged to King Manasseh. That's cool. I mean, that is cool, right? He was a ruler in, back in Old Testament, Second Kings time. Yeah, and archaeologists yeah. also have uncovered a fortified building in the Golan Heights dated to the time of David's rule, about 1000 BC. That's amazing. So today, you'll see recent discoveries that connect us to the time of Jesus, beginning with this rare coin. Watch this. Cool. Those who enter the old city through the historic Jaffa Gate are welcomed by the visually striking Tower of David Museum. Here at the Tower of David Museum, they discovered the foundations of King Herod's palace. These stairs lead down to the pools of his elaborate complex. And many historians and theologians believe it was at this palace that Jesus was brought before King Herod and Pontius Pilate. Right near us, the excavation of the Kishle you can find the foundation of this palace. We have the pool, the foundation, the Fatsael Tower. So we probably know that Jesus was here during his time in Jerusalem. And it was here that renovations led to the discovery of this rare silver Tyra coin. This is a very strong coin, very heavy silver. That's why it's so rare. Jerusalem is full of treasures, and this is one of them. This coin was likely used to pay the temple tax during the reign of King Herod. Elat Lieber, the director of the museum, told CBN News the discovery brings the story of the Gospels alive. And we know from the Gospels that Jesus visited Jerusalem. We know that he talked to the money changers. So here we have the evidence, the archaeological evidence, to the historical sources. Another major part of the renovation is the Faisal Tower built by King Herod. Yotam Carmel heads up the conservation project. It's important nationally, I think, internationally, and also personally, but uh, to really touch this kind of structure is uh, moving for me. Trying to preserve something and actually let it live on for future generations and actually to do the best which is possible to keep as much original fabric as possible. Carmel says the work Herod envisioned and ordered is exquisite. Unbelievable. I mean, it's hard to understand how they lift, how they build, and how long it will last. I mean, it will last for thousands of years more. Unbelievable building system. Hard to get your mind around it, how, how it was done. It was just a massive scale of stone carving and building, uh, which is very rare to see. In 37 BC, Herod established himself as king of Judea and began some of the most ambitious building projects in the ancient world, including the reconstruction of the Second Temple. He transformed the city of Jerusalem so much that Pliny the Elder wrote, Jerusalem was by far the most distinguished city, not in Judea only, but of the whole Orient. Lieber says the Tower of David Museum connects the ages. You can see how the past, the present, and the future are actually here at the Tower of David. And we can actually know more about our identity. Christians can see how the Gospels are coming alive here in Jerusalem. She says their goal is to tell Jerusalem's story. This is the most exciting part of our works because all we want is to bring Jerusalem to the world. The story of Jerusalem, the rich history of all of us, Jewish people, Christians from all over the world. The coin will be part of the new exhibition at the Tower of David Museum, while the renovation work will continue for more than a year. Chris Mitchell, the Tower of David Museum, Jerusalem. Benjamin Franklin said, in this world, nothing is certain except death 
and taxes. <laughs> you know, as contentious as it is today, taxes were as, just as controversial in the ancient world. In Luke 20, verse 22, it says, uh, people were asking Jesus, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus saw through their duplicity and he said to them, show me a denarius whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You know, when Jesus said, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he was drawing a sharp distinction between two kingdoms. There are the material kingdoms, what we see in this world, and earthly rulers hold power over them. But there also is another kingdom, not of this world, things we do not see, but that is equally as real, and Jesus is the king of that kingdom. So, under earthly rulers, we have certain obligations that involve material things. But under Jesus, we have other obligations that involve eternal things. So Jesus was saying, if Caesar demands money, give it to him. But make sure you also give God what he deserves. Caesar minted coins, as he had a right to do. And he demanded some coins in return, as was his right. After all, it was his image that was stamped on what he had made. But God has minted the human soul, and he has stamped his image on every one of us. So yes, give Caesar his due, the temporary stuff of this world, but make sure you're investing in things that really matter, things that are eternal, like faith, hope, and love. So what are you investing your life in today? I wanna encourage you to invest in things that are eternal. And we'd love to pray with you. If you have prayer for anything, uh, call us today at 1-855-759-0700. And as a free resource, we have your identity in Christ. It'll tell you who you really are and what you should really invest your life in. Well, up next, archeologists reveal an ancient suburb from the time of Jesus. New building construction here often uncovers ancient treasures. That's the case in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Sharafat. This site was a Jewish village 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists uncovered it as they were preparing the site for a new elementary school. The most spectacular find here is of a grand burial estate. Archaeologist Yaakov Billig is heading this excavation, which today sits inside Jerusalem. Back then, this would have been more like a suburb. The burial estate starts from a stepped long corridor going under a bridge like an overpass into a courtyard with a bench on one side and a bench on another side. Then from there upwards, there was a covered entrance to the burial cave. And from then on inwards, there's the underground burial cave. Billig said the burial estate tells a lot about its owners. The whole plan here belongs to some very important and or rich person with his family, possibly even for several generations. They've also identified a Jewish ritual bath and much more. We have evidence of the wine press with a very large treading floor where they placed the grapes. We also have an olive press. Between the wine and the olive oil, they probably had quite a high living standard here. The best of the harvest was likely delivered to the temple, just an hour's walk away. In the far right corner, you can see a small press that is the real virgin olive oil, which is probably the real top quality. I assume when the temple existed not far away, that went as a dedication to the temple. Thank you, God, for giving me the abundance of which I have now. Billig said discoveries like this tell us much more about the people from that time. They had probably a lot of interaction with the population of the city, maybe even for the pilgrims who made pilgrimage to the city. We can't forget that Jerusalem had to be supplied by produce of agricultural products. And here we have evidence of growing grapes, producing wine, growing olives, producing olive oil, growing pigeons, supplying the population with poultry, with eggs, uh, 
also sacrifices for the temple. As for what's ahead, a school is planned on the actual excavation site. Pottery fragments and other discoveries like this rare heart-shaped capital will be preserved off-site. Archaeologists hope the things that can't be moved will be preserved on the school grounds. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Sharafat, Jerusalem. Well, it was one of my favorite days when I was in Israel. I learned when I was visiting the village of Nazareth a little more about this olive press. Now we saw an original olive press and we learned that the first pressing, as you heard in the, in the segment, the first pressing of the olives produced the highest quality oil and that would be taken to the temple as an act of worship. Well, the second time they pressed the oil, they got good quality oil and it'd be used for their food, for medicine, for perfume or cosmetics. But there was a third pressing and that quality was actually the lowest quality, the bad oil. But they would use it for their oil lamps and making soap. They didn't waste anything. Well, do you know, we're reminded in the Bible when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's that's, that word Gethsemane is actually made out of two Hebrew words, got and shwanim, which literally means press of oils. And we see Jesus literally pressed in the garden as he prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, like the pressing of oils. He anguished prior to going to the cross for us and pouring out his life. Isaiah 53, 5 tells it this way, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. See, Jesus crushing death provides healing and it provides life to those who receive it as a gift. We have a resource called A Certain Salvation. Maybe right now you're not sure if you're actually saved, if you've actually received this gift of life. Well, first of all, just pray now and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for dying for me. I receive the forgiveness of my sins and I choose to follow you today. He wants you to follow him and love him and experience him more. So give us a call for prayer. We're here for you. When we return, you'll see a recently recovered road that was built by Pontius Pilate. Someone should download the CBN Family app to get an easy view at all of CBN's media. Having access easily to that faith-based content is so invaluable. This is a great way I could take that with me on the go, you know? This app is really easy to use. My favorite feature is the fact that you can look at like the different like feeds, like the news, animations. This app has exactly what you're looking for as far as Christian values go. They call it the biblical superhighway the pilgrim's path that led to the Jewish temple in ancient times. The places and events and the peoples that make Jerusalem, Jerusalem. For Christians, for Jews, it all happened here in the city of David. This is where the beating heart of Jerusalem is. We're talking about the Pool of Siloam. We're talking about Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. We're talking about the city of David. The pilgrimage road links them all together. For Jews in ancient days, their pilgrimage began here at the Pool of Siloam. It's a mikveh or ritual bath. It's the size of two Olympic swimming pools. They would purify themselves here before going up to the Temple Mount to worship God. The historian Josephus says that 2,000 years ago on the pilgrimage festivals, there would have been more than 2 million people going up on pilgrimage. That's a lot of people who need to bathe. The pool is also where Jesus healed the blind man as recounted in the book of John. Its location was hidden by a road until 15 years ago when a sewage leak led to excavations, the discovery of the pool, and much more. The archaeologists, when they find the Pool of Siloam, so they understand if that's the pool, and they know where the temple stood on the Temple Mount some 2,000 years ago, the same Temple Mount is today. Zev Orenstein with the City of David Foundation says archaeologists wondered how the pilgrims traveled from the pool to the Temple Mount. So the archaeologists widened the excavation, and we are standing on the very answer to that question. We are standing atop the ancient pilgrimage road. These are the stones that Jesus would have walked on on his way up to the temple. And now the significance of the excavation of the pilgrimage road is that for the first time in 2,000 years, 
Visitors will be able to walk all the way from the Pool of Siloam up to the Western Wall. The word in the Bible, the Hebrew words, is aliyah le regel, or mm -hmm. ole regel. Now, what we understand that to mean is it's a spiritual ascent. You're going up to the temple, yeah. going to Jerusalem. It's a very holy place. But, Chris, when you're in the place where the Bible happened, the words of the Bible come to life. Because as we're walking right now, and I'm sure you could feel it, mm -hmm. we're walking uphill. And it was more than that. This would have been like Times Square. You would have had on both sides of the road. And keep in mind, the road is about three, four, five times wider than what we see over here. You would have had shops, stalls along both sides of the road. This is the center of Jerusalem from a spiritual perspective, from a communal perspective, also from a, a commerce perspective. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, the road took 10 years to build from 20 to 30 AD and was constructed by Pontius Pilate. One of the major issues of Jerusalem is that it's a living city. All the layers, all the archaeological layers are built on top of one another and the modern uh, living uh, quarters and everything is built on top of the archaeological layers. Excavation manager Ari Levy says uncovering the road is a major engineering feat. We have modern neighborhood uh, just above our heads and we don't want it to collapse. After each meter that we take out, uh, each meter of soil, we enter an arch like uh, construction like this. This supports the entire weight of what we have uh, above us. Along the route, you can see many places where the road remains intact and others where it's destroyed given its violent history. We know that the Romans, they destroyed Jerusalem. And if you would find everything perfectly intact, well, it wouldn't seem like much of a destruction. Among the discovered treasures are small coins minted during the Great Jewish Revolt before the Romans destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in 70 AD. Scholars often wonder why the Jews made worthless coins instead of weapons. Orenstein has the answer. Jews of Jerusalem understood that the Romans were likely going to destroy the city, hmm. but they also believed that one day in the future, their descendants would return and find these coins, and they would know what their ancestors lived and died for, for a free Jerusalem. And here we are nearly 2,000 years later, standing along the very same pilgrimage road here in the city of David, in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish state of Israel. Half of the pilgrimage road will open soon to the public, and within a few years, all the way from the Pool of Siloam to the Western Wall. That will give visitors a first-hand experience of what it was like to worship God in the time of Jesus. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, along the pilgrimage road in the city of David, Jerusalem. Connect with us on social media to watch shows anytime and to access additional content. The fifth commandment found in Exodus 20 verse 12 says, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So what does it mean to honor in a culture that really has lost this virtue? Because I think some people take it to one extreme. That means my kids have to do what I say and give me respect. On the other hand, there's people who are saying, I don't think my parents are worthy of honor. So let's go back to the original meaning of the word. In the positive, that word means literally to carry a weight. It was used of the prophet Samuel, who was worthy of weight. He carried a weight about him. You know when someone walks into a room and they just have an air of respect because of what they've accomplished or who they are or what they represent? That's the positive. In the negative, though, this word, honor, uh, is translated in the negative way to be weighed down. It's used when Pharaoh put extra burdens and weights on the nation of Israel. So the key in understanding this word honor is to know that honor is not something that you demand, it's something given freely. And the key to honor is responsibility. And what you do with the responsibility you're given either warrants respect or increases another person's burden. So to those of you in authority, are you using your authority in a way that warrants respect or in a way that increases the burden? And to those under authority, are you giving honor to those who are carrying a weight for you. For both, if you choose honor, the Bible promises a good life, and that is what I want for you. In whatever circumstance you face, God wants you to have victory. It's not too late. 
believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life. And if you need to talk with someone who understands, all you have to do is call us at 1-855-759-0700. A prayer partner is waiting to listen and pray with you today. As we've been talking about the Hebraic roots of the Christian faith, of course, the center person has been Jesus. But today I want to focus on another person that if we understand something he said, it'll also help us to understand something that Jesus does later on in his life. And that person is John. We call him John the Baptist. And we know John as kind of uh, that, that crazy cousin of Jesus. He lives out in the wilderness and he wears clothes made of camel's hair and he eats, he eats locusts and wild honey and all this kind of crazy stuff. And he's known for a few things, but one of the things that he's really known for is what I call, it's his claim to fame. You know, when he stands up in the wilderness and he says, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And it's this wow, glorious, momentous statement. But we've got to understand, how could he say such a thing? Did he even have the right to say such a thing? In the time of the temple, one of the duties or responsibilities of the high priest was to select a perfect lamb, who was to find her firstborn male, its bones could not be broken, it could have no spots or blemishes. There was all kinds of things that God spoke about back in, in, in the Torah about what the lamb had to look like. But only the priest had the right to declare who that lamb was. So who in the world is John? What gives him the right to make this declaration? Luke, again, our friend. Remember the Gentile author? He says something in Luke 1, verse 5, that we don't always pick up on, but when we do, it gives validity to the statement of John. He says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Now that's, that's his, his father. He's also a priest. But then it says, his wife Elizabeth, she was also a descendant of who? Of Aaron. It's telling us there that not only does John have priestly lineage on his father's side, but he now also has it on his mother's side. And in Judaism, your, your, your Jewishness is given to you from your mother's side. So look at it then. John not only has a royal blood on his dad's side, but he also has it on his mom's side. So therefore, according to the laws of the land, he has the right as somebody from the priestly family he can make the selection that year and say, this is the lamb that's gonna die for the sins of the people. And when you think of that, think of the power that it meant in those days and in that time, that he stands up and as a person with the right lineage, he sees Jesus coming and he says, hey, this is the one. Behold, this is the one that God has sent to us. We've been rehearsing, we've been practicing, we've been getting ready for the lamb to come and this is the one that God has chosen. He's not come just to take away the sin and cover it for another year or cover it for another season, but this is the lamb that God has sent. And when this lamb's blood is shed for you, his blood will not only cover your sin, but it will take it away. Hi, I'm Ray McDonald, and on behalf of Like It Israel, the National Food Bank, I want to say, Thank you. Through your support of 700 Club Canada, you are partnering with what God is doing in fulfilling His covenant promises to the people of Israel. Together, we are providing food to a quarter of a million Israelis each week. So again, I want to say thanks and God bless you. Isn't that amazing, the work they're doing? And you can be part of it. Yeah, you. All you have to do is join 700 Club Canada as a partner. And today, for a one-time donation of any amount, you're going to get this amazing DVD written in stone, Kings and Prophets. It's truly inspiring. It's a journey into the Holy Land and ancient Persia to see how stunning archaeological discoveries are revealing clear evidence about the lives of Israel's most renowned leaders. So why don't you call us today and you'll get a copy of Written in Stone, 1-855-759-0700. Names from the Old Testament are being unearthed all over the city of Jerusalem. 
This was amazing. Come as close as you can get to personalities that are known from the Bible. Astonishing discoveries made today. A jaw-dropping moment of Bible archaeology. This is much more than a thrill. This is actual history that took place here on the site where we sit right now. Confirm the kings and prophets of the Bible left real evidence of their lives. Right time, the right place, with the right people. And one of the most significant finds in recent history. Exactly as the Bible tells us happened in the days of King Hezekiah. Written in stone, kings and prophets. We have the Bible and we have archaeologists. Telling our story, it's matching. The Old Testament is a reliable history book. Written in stone, kings and prophets. What a fascinating show. Just to understand the depths of scripture, like you can read scripture, you know, surfacey, but if you understand the background and the stories and the people and the time, it adds such enrichment to it, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it's really like layers. It's almost like an archeological dig. Right, right. As you keep digging into God's word, you reveal new layers, new thoughts, new ideas, and they actually just build on each other until a whole picture is revealed. The great thing about the Bible is the more you read it, the more you study it, the more you really know, see, and understand God. It's true. And Israel's like walking right yeah. in the Bible, right? Absolutely. But we want to pray uh, with you and for you. And thank you to those of you who have called our prayer lines. You know that we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's any time we're available to you. And Sammy said, please pray that my daughter would have a hunger and thirst for the Lord and that God does a work in her heart. Yeah, and Roxanne said, please pray for my family to be able to purchase a home. And so why don't we just pray right now? God, first of all, we pray for Sammy. I just pray that um, with this family situation and dynamic, that you would open a door of opportunity, the right word at the right time in the right way. And for Roxanne as well, God, you know exactly what we need when we need it. That's what I love about you. You're always listening, always attentive, and always moving. And so I pray for both Sammy and Roxanne that you'd give them confidence that you are going to meet them at their point of need today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. So no matter your request, right, Bill? Whether it's a practical need, an yep. emotional need, a relational need, God wants to hear it all. Well, and there's something really therapeutic, I guess, is not made there, or spiritual, about expressing it. There is, certainly is. I think that's why Scripture talks so much about speaking it out. Absolutely. Right? And uh, that's prayer, but it's also thanksgiving. There's power in that. And I believe, too, that's where faith is connected to the what we speak out. It yes. really shows what we believe. And so, Sammy and Roxanne, we want yeah. you to tell us when that prayer is answered. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So let's do that. Thanks so much for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Next on the 700 Club Canada, church leader Phil Kniesel discusses how the church can be effective in a rapidly changing world and a couple turns to God to save their marriage after a secret affair. <laughs>